Okay, so how is everyone today? Good, I hope. Okay, so first announcement, and this is an important one. Well, at any rate, it, it matters, but you'd, fi you'd figure it out even if you didn't hear, is that uh, there's no quiz this week. And the reason why there's no quiz <laughs> in the end is because as I was reviewing the notes, uh, primarily we went over that big theorem, the big important theorem, the bolzano weierstrass theorem. And it's a beautiful thing, uh, but in the end I can't figure out how to ask a question about it that doesn't amount to either something that's too trivial or just would just, you know, be, be too much punishment and anxiety to it, try to do in 30 minutes at a quiz. So uh, I'll have to let that one stew in my head for a little bit, how I could possibly ask a reasonable question uh, about that. But for now, I'm just going to be conservative and not ask a question yet. OK, good. So no quiz this week. Lovely. <clears throat> well, part of, yeah, kind of, yeah. We'll go with that. OK, so what's today, the third? Yes. Third. OK. <clears throat> So uh, we've been talking about the uh, derivative. We've been talking about the derivative. So in particular, uh, we've talked about a few notions of the derivative. Uh, we have the old notion from scalar calculus, calculus of functions from scalars to scalars. We have, we have this notion of derivative. And this particularly nice uh, formulation allows you to divide by h. You can divide by h. Uh, when, when h is a scalar, and it ends up working out nicely. Uh, notably, one of the very, very nice things about that is that when, when uh, the inputs are scalars, the inputs are also vectors. <laughs> right? So that is to say that uh, a scalar itself contains both its magnitude and its direction. Okay? However, when you try to export this definition <coughs> to the vector case where, where the input uh, is now a vector, you can't just textually substitute the h scalars for h vectors because then you, you, division by a vector is not defined. So we had to go through this kind of long, uh, drawn out process to separate uh, the notion of the magnitude of the input versus the direction of the input, which is why the deriv definition of derivative takes that weird form. Okay, where you have to divide by the magnitude of h, and then you have to solve if you have to you have to see if there is a linear operator, uh, a linear function that you can solve for within that limit that's equal to zero. Okay, fine. Uh, then, <laughs> then we said, well, uh, what that that's not a really super useful definition for the purposes of computing derivatives. If I if I was to give you a, uh, a function uh, whose input is a vector and whose output is a vector. Uh, and by that, I mean not scalars. So like whose input is, say, something from R2 and whose output is something from, R, uh, something from R5. And if I was to give it to you in terms of formulas, like polynomials and trig functions and things like that, then how could you expediently compute the derivative? Jacobian. The Jacobian matrix, right? The Jacobian. So in particular, in particular, uh, when a function has a derivative at a point, when it exists, because it need not exist, but when it does have one, the columns of that matrix are given by, uh, the first column is given by the partial derivative with respect to the first variable. And the second derivative is given, uh, sorry, the second column is given by the partial derivative with respect to the second variable, et cetera. Okay, so then you can just fill out the columns of the Jacobian matrix one column at a time. Okay, good. So that's kind of remembrance of, of what happened last time. This question? <coughs> any, any questions? Concerns? Okay. <coughs> so now we're in section 1.8. And this, it's titled something like Rules for Differentiation. Now, to make, to, in an attempt, so I'm going to attempt to do two things. In the first place, I'm going to attempt to put this into the context of something that you already know. And I'm also going to attempt to fill any gaps 
uh, of knowledge that you're supposed to already know but might not yet know. So <clears throat> the derivative, it, we can have a function that, that does this, for example, in this stranger notation. f is equal to the function which takes an input x and then outputs uh, x squared plus 1. So you give it an x, it outputs x squared plus 1. So what is the signature of f? What kind of thing is f? Scalar. Scalars to scalars, right? It takes a scalar input and produces a scalar output. So this, this is, uh, is reals to reals. It takes a real input, produces a real output. I could do, I could write something else, like uh, say, <coughs> g is the function which takes, uh, which takes an x and produces, say, uh, the sine of x in the first coordinate and um, 3x in the second coordinate. So what kind of thing is g? Yeah, right, real, so r1, the implied one is there, to r2. Okay, and then I could, you could imagine we could do a whole bunch of examples, okay, R3 to R8, et cetera, blah, blah, blah. But here's my question for you. Suppose that we dispense with the calculus one notation for derivative. The, the, the typical notation is something like this, so d dx of, say, x squared. So if you were in a calculus one class, what would be the correct response? 2x, okay, but I'm going to dispense with that notation and just write d for derivative, okay, and that now what's the correct response? Still 2x, right? And remember, to, to us now, we're also construing that 2x to be a one-by-one one <coughs> matrix, right? So by, by writing that, I mean the function that takes an x and produces x squared, so, th so the results the linearization of x squared is a one-by-one one matrix because it takes a one-dimensional input and produces a one-dimensional output. So this is a one, um, <coughs> pardon me, one-by-one one matrix. My question to you is, if, is that if the signature of this function is reals to reals, and if the signature of this function is R1 to R2, what is the signature of the derivative when it is interpreted as a function? What does it do? So the kind of thing that you give f, viewing f as a machine, you put a real in, right? You, you walk up to the f machine, you put a real in, a real pops out the other side. Let's think here. Well, the output should be the same signature. So if I put if I put a if I put a function into the derivative, then supposing this function is in fact differentiable, then then the, the signature of the input function should be the same as the signature of the output function. But now I've given away the game. What is what kind of inputs do you give to the derivative? Do you give it real numbers? You give it functions, right? You give it functions. That's what it does. <clears throat> so in the, same, in the same manner that f is one of these, d is one of these. It's something that takes a function and produces from that a new function. Of course, this is a bit of an abuse of notation, because what I mean is that suppose that you input a differentiable function the output will be yet another function. That's what I, that's what I mean by this. So the, again, this is not entirely precise, but I'm trying to be fast and loose on purpose. The thing I want you to uh, take away from this is that the derivative itself is a function. It's a function whose input is a function and whose output is a function, okay? You put functions in, functions come back out. Functions all the way down, right? Good. 
So then the question is, then the question is, uh, in linear algebra, in linear algebra, in the end, you, you studied matrices and, and what it means for vectors to span and, and, and all kinds of stuff like that. But in the end, the primary, the primary uh, actor, the primary thing of study in linear algebra are functions who so happen to be linear. Right? Functions, functions that are both homogeneous and additive. So homogeneous means what? What can you do with the argument to the function? Right. Scalars can be factored in and out of the argument. That's what, that's what homogeneity means. It's where algebra is concerned. Where geometry is concerned, it means that, that uh, it, it, it's a flat thing that goes through the origin. Okay. That is to say, if you picked a particular uh, vector, you could scale it all the way down to the origin and all the way as far away from the origin as you want in a straight line, like a star. Then ad additivity means additivity means what with respect to the arguments and the function? What does it mean for a function to be additive? The argument to sum, mm -hmm. sum to argument. Right. It's, it's meaning that you can commute the order of the function and addition. You can either perform the addition first and then apply the function, or you can apply the function to the individual arguments and then compute the addition. Either one. You can commute the order of function application and addition. So th those turn out to be very important, important enough to have an entire topic all to itself, linear algebra. How do, how do, these, functions, uh, how do these functions interact with add and, and, and scale? multiply by scalar and, and things like this. So the question that we're going to address today is when you consider the derivative as a function itself, how does it interact with all the things you can do to functions? Because given two functions, you can add them together and get a new function. Right? Suppo supposing that they have the same signature. Right? They have to have the same kind of inputs and the same kind of outputs. You can take two functions and supposing that the product is compatible, you can compute a product and then and you have a new function as a result. So you can take two functions and add them, new function. You can take two uh, functions and multiply them, new function. You can take functions and multiply them by a scalar, so like f of x times 8, this is a new function, etc. What's, what's, what's the one that I haven't mentioned yet that you can do with functions? There's a very important one. Composition, Composition right? Composition. So what we're going to do is we're going to we're going to consider all these operations: the sum of functions, the product of functions, the composition of functions, the multiplication of functions by scalars, and we're going to see how does the derivative interact with this. Okay, how does the derivative interact with with sum, product, and composition, and things like this? So <coughs> let's briefly write down the things that you already know. From, from, these, are, these are from scalar calculus, that is. So supposing, uh, supposing that, uh, what? Let u, a subset of the reals, be open. A is an element of uh, u. So, so that'll be enough for the first two. So if f from u to the reals and g from u to the reals. So these are scalar calculus functions, not, not, not vector functions, uh, are differentiable. at point A, then the, you could take the sum function, so the derivative of f of f plus g evaluated at A is what? Very good. So this would be 
d of f evaluated at a plus d of g evaluated at a. So that's nice. That's nice. What does that say about the derivative where addition of functions is concerned? The derivative is what? Is additive. Ah, oh, the derivative is additive. That's terrific. Okay. <clears throat> Furthermore, uh, the derivative of t multiplied by f at a is something, and I'm going to say now for all t in the reals, okay, yeah, is that this is t multiplied by the derivative of f at a. So these are results from your previous calculus classes. What's the name for this one? Homogeneity. So what is, what is, the, what is the case about derivative? It's linear. It's linear over, over functions which are differentiable at, at, at that point. Okay, that's nice. <clears throat> well, how about this one? So I'll say that that's 1.1 and this one 1.2. And now 1.3, now it starts to get interesting. Uh, what is the derivative of the product function. So that's a solid dot. It's not the product of derivatives. This is the product rule. Yeah. So this is the derivative of f evaluated at a multiplied by g. So you take the derivative of the first one and multiply it by the second, and then what? Add, add to it the first one multiplied by the derivative of the second one. This, of course, is the product rule. <laughs> but usually this one is called the sum rule. <laughs> and this, uh, this one is usually called the, I don't, I don't know what. I always call it homogeneity. <laughs> <laughs> Multiply by constant rule, I'm not sure. Uh, this one, the product rule. Okay, another one. 1.4 is that uh, the derivative of f evaluated at a is equal to, I'm leaving myself a blank spot here, when f is a constant function. Zero, right? Zero. And then the last one. <clears throat> the last one. So uh, the way uh, for this one is that what is the derivative of f composed with g evaluated at a? So in the first place, what's the name for that? The chain rule, right? Isn't that nice? The derivative of sum is, sum is called the sum rule. The derivative of product is called the product rule. The derivative of a quotient is called the quotient rule. So naturally, the derivative of a composition is called the chain rule. Isn't that obvious? Surely that's obvious, right? OK, so what's the, what is the, <laughs> is, is that aggravating? It, it aggravates me every time I say it. So right. Right. So it is the derivative of f, so you have to differentiate f, and then evaluate that at g of a, and then what? Multiply by the derivative of g, and where do you evaluate this? At a. OK, so these are basically all the rules from, from scalar calculus. And from these, uh, especially the, the, the linearity of the derivative, and the product rule and things like that, everything else follows. Uh, for example, the derivative of all the uh, polynomials. So, so I, I now just import all of that. All that's imported now. And then after a hop, skip, and a jump, uh, a few limits and things like that, you get all the derivatives of trig functions and exponential functions and things like that. So those are all, all imported now. So now that's all legitimate. <coughs> 
Uh, however, I want to make sure some things are clear, uh, especially <coughs> about some of these rules, because my experience tells me that often students get here and don't completely understand them. So, <coughs> in the first place, let's talk about the product rule for a minute. So suppose that, suppose that we had a rectangle uh, and one of the side lengths of the rectangle, we, we got out our ruler, we all agreed on the ruler, the linear measuring device, and we said, oh, one of the side lengths is three and the other side length uh, is five. Then what's, what's the area of this? How did you achieve that? Product, right? Product. So, so the thing is, what I want you to have in your head is that product of things is, is associated to areas. Okay, so somehow, somehow the product rule, because, because we're considering the product of functions, somehow this must be related to an area of a rectangle, somehow. So let's, let's make it explicit. Why, sh why does the product rule look the way it does? Please don't memorize it. I mean, by, by all means, memorize it. But what, what, I mean is, what I mean is don't just memorize it. So let's consider. What if we had a little rectangle like this? And if we said that this was, the base was x and the height was y? And I want you to go with the fiction for a moment. So in the first place, what is the area of that rectangle? XY. It's x, y, right? Now I want you to imagine that for some reason, for some cause, uh, I cause the, the x to get a little bigger. I, I cause the x to get a little bigger, and suppose that it gets a little bigger, and the little bit bigger measurement is delta x, so that it looks like this. So now it's still a rectangle, but it's a, a little bit bigger. What is, the new, what is the new area, the area that is a result of it getting bigger? Just, just the new area. Delta x times y, right? Just this new area is delta x times y. So understand that that's the pr delta x multiplied by y. Okay. Then suppose further that by some cause I, I, I make y get a little bigger also. And suppose it gets bigger like, like that much. So they're not necessarily getting bigger by the same amount. <clears throat> and now I want to demark. I want, I want you to imagine that, well, what if, what if instead of asking for x first, I, I did y first? Then what would be just that new area right there? x times delta y. So this would be uh, x multiplied by delta y. And then the, the little bit in the corner, what would, what would its area be? Very good. So what I want you to look at is that imagine that we had that original rectangle that was x, y, y. And then imagine for some reason at the same time I caused x and y to get bigger at the same time. And the amount that x got bigger was delta x. The amount that y got bigger was delta y. Then the new three regions of area, this one, that one, and that one, would have areas like they're written. OK. <clears throat> now what I want you to imagine is that we have a rectangle. And this horizontal measurement is given by a function, say, uh, at, we'll call it f of x. And the vertical measurement is given by a different function, g of x. So what's the area of this rectangle? Right, the product of these. So f of x, g of x. And then I want you to imagine that down here I have an axis. This is the x-axis. And right here, at this point, I have an x. There's the x. And 
I want you to imagine that I could grab this X, I could grab it and wiggle it around, and as a result of my wiggling it, uh, you'd see F getting bigger or smaller, you'd see G getting bigger or smaller, and the whole thing could kind of tremble around. So now, for the sake of drawing, I want you to imagine that specifically I'm going to move this X a little bit to the right, and furthermore, as a result, the value of F is going to get bigger and the value of G is going to get bigger. In principle, they could stay the same or get smaller, but it's too difficult to draw all the combinations, so I'm just going to go with they all get bigger. Okay. <clears throat> So then, let's say that the amount that I move x to the right is h. Let's say that it's h, and let's say that as a result of that, as a result, f of x gets that much bigger. So this measurement right here, this measurement right here is f of x. What is this measurement right here? F of x plus h, right? Because that's where the new, that's, that's the new place that f is being evaluated. Okay, now, so now we're going to do exactly the same thing with g. So this is g, and then g gets bigger because we changed the evaluation point. And what is this new measurement? G of x plus h. OK. So now, here's the thing. If f and g are both differentiable, if f and g are both differentiable, and h is really small, then this measurement right here is well approximated by the derivative. That's what differentiability is saying. So the exact value, the exact value of this measurement is what? That measurement right there. Very good. So it's f of x plus h minus f of x. That is, is it, <coughs> pardon me, that is, is its exact measurement, the difference between those two. The derivative is saying, the fact that this is differentiable is saying that we can approximate this quite well with the following expression. So this is approximately the derivative of f evaluated at x, and then what? Multiplied by h. That's what differentiability of f is saying, that this is approximately that. And if you're not totally convinced, take this side and divide it by h. What I mean is divide both sides by h. Then the left-hand side would be the slope of the secant line. Right? Similarly, similarly, what is the exact measurement right here? So this, the, the amount that it, g changed. Well, that's g of x plus h minus g of x. That's exactly what it is. And then taking g to be differentiable there, what is the, and, and supposing that h is small for some suitable definition of small, then what's the approximation for this? The derivative of g at x multiplied by h. OK. So that means, that means that we can come up with uh, if we wish to, we could come up with exact formulas for all of these three new pieces, but I just want to use the approximate formulas and wave my hands a little bit and say that they're going to be good enough because h is going to be small and f and g are differentiable. Yes? Why does this not work for big h's? Well, I guess that's just it's, it's the same reason that, it, it, it's, it's exactly the same reason to say that uh, if we were in Kansas, and since, 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 since you and I are so small, then some very powerful being could, in principle, stop the clock, replace Kansas with a flat plane that, that we're walking around is, and is invisible, and we, would, we couldn't tell. But if we were in a car, and we were traveling, and, and, and in fact, we were traveling just through Kansas, and you get about 100 miles away, and you're on this 
invisible force field plane, you're going to start to notice, oh, the Earth is way down there now. Big H's. If you travel far away from the point of attachment, it won't work. Uh, so, so, the approximation for this area right here is, is how much? So, what's its base? F of x. And what's its height? About that much. So this will be f of x multiplied by the derivative of g at x multiplied by h. That's approximately its area. Similarly, what is the approximation of this one's area? Well, this one will be the derivative of f multiplied by g, uh, sorry, multiplied by h and then multiplied by g of x. So that's, let's rewrite that, that's terrible. The derivative of f at x multiplied by h multiplied by g of x. That's what that one is. <clears throat> okay, and then what's the area of the one in the corner? Right. So now we have the derivative of f multiplied by the derivative of g both at x, and then now we have h squared because there's two of them now, two h's. Okay, now, suppose that for sake of argument, suppose that for sake of argument we write that a of x is that product. a for what? Area. Okay, then we can come up with a, with, with, uh, with a, a formula for the exact new area. The exact new area is a of x, uh, sorry, the, the, the exact total area, not the area which was created, but the area of the new thing, is f of x plus h, g of x plus h. But now I want us to come up with an approximation for just the area that is recently created. So that is to say, that one minus that one. So that one minus that one. A of x plus h minus a of x is approximately, well, it's going to be the sum of these three areas, isn't it? It's going to be that new piece plus that new piece plus that new piece. We have approximations for them already. f of x, g prime of x, h plus uh, f prime of x, h g of x plus f prime of x g of x uh, g prime of x h squared. The three new pieces. The two bigger ones and the little one. Now take this thing and divide by h. So if we do that and divide by h then this is saying f of x, g prime of x, plus f of x, uh, no, f prime of x, g of x, plus <coughs> the product of the derivatives, and 1h remains. There's an h left over. So now it's just a matter of waving hands and computing a limit. If you compute a limit of the left-hand side, that's the derivative of a. And h would be the limit symbol. What's going to be the limit of this when h goes to 0? Itself. Why? No h's. What's this one's limit? Itself, because there's no h's. And what's the limit of that one? 0, because this is whatever it is, some constant with respect to h, multiplied by h. So the product rule is really saying a statement about, this, about a rectangle that looks like this. That's what it's saying. Okay, <clears throat> good. Uh, also, I'd like to note something that, may, that you may have found just a little bit disturbing, and I did it on purpose, and that is that uh, I wrote the H right there. That's a little disturbing, maybe, to you, huh? Because I wrote it there instead of in the other spot. And furthermore, it might have been a little bit disturbing to you that I wrote F G prime plus F prime G. Maybe that was a little bit disturbing. Uh, well, it's, gonna, it's going to have to be that way by the end of today. 
So in principle, you could, on this page, commute these into whatever order you desire. But by the end of today, you will not be able to commute them, and this will be the right order. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Good. So, the chain rule. So, what the chain rule does is it tells you what functions do under composition. Okay, so what I want you to imagine is that functions are machines that have inputs and outputs. So if that's the F machine and its output is Y, then that Y is given by the formula F of X, right? And what I want you to imagine is that what if I, what if I take this X and I wiggle it around just a little bit? I cause it to wiggle. That would cause the output to wiggle a little bit as well. Okay, so now, if I, if I take X and I increase its value just a little bit, and that results in the value of y increasing a little bit, then what does that tell you about the derivative? The derivative must be some positive value. That's what that's saying. What if I take x and I increase it a little bit, and as a result, y decreases a little bit? What's that telling you about the derivative? Negative. It's negative. Okay. What if I, what if I wiggle I x uh, just barely, just hardly any at all, but a positive amount, and then there's a, and then y wiggles a lot on the output side. Then the derivative ha is, is very big in magnitude. That, that would mean like if you make a very small change in the input, the output changes a great, great deal. That's saying that the derivative is quite big. Whereas if you wiggle the input and you don't notice the output wiggle at all, what is that telling you about the derivative? It's zero. The derivative is zero there. Okay, so here's the thing about machines that have inputs and outputs. Okay, the whole, uh, uh, an enormous part of the, of, of the previous century's industrial revolution was, was the understanding that, oh, if we have machines that have inputs and outputs, then we can take the output of this machine and make it the input to the next machine. <laughs> And that's called an assembly line, right? You take machines and you put them all in an order, input this, you give inputs to that one, it makes outputs, and which is input to the next one, et cetera, all the way down the line. So when you take this, when you take functions and you take that view, if you say, okay, first I'm gonna give X to the G machine, and it's gonna make a G of X, and then I'm going to use that as input to the F machine. And it's going to make what? An F of G of X. This is composition. This is putting, putting the machines in a row. And now the question is, now the question is, I can ask the question twice in a row. I could say, just like I was asking above for F, I could say, well, what if I wiggle X? And, and I, I make x a little bigger and g of x gets a little bigger, that says that g's derivative is positive, etc. I could ask all those questions. But now the question I'm going to ask is I'm going to say, if I wiggle x, how does that one wiggle? It is like asking, suppose that I, suppose that I put all of this in a big box and obscure it from your view, and we just give a name to that box, or, or don't even give a name yet. If I wiggle this input, how does this output wiggle in response? If a, po if a positive increment here results in a negative increment there, then the derivative is negative, et cetera, things like that. So what's the name for this box? <laughs> its name is F composed with G. That's its name. That's its name. So now, what we're addressing, just like on the previous page we addressed, what does derivative do with product? We're asking right now, what does derivative do with composition? What does it do with it? Okay. <clears throat> the answer to the question is, of course, the chain rule. But why should it be the way that it is? 
So we know that the derivative of f composed with g evaluated at x is given by derivative of f evaluated at g of x multiplied by the derivative of g evaluated at x. Why should it be exactly like this and not some other way? Okay. <clears throat> let's consider. Uh, let's, I'm going to draw a slightly strange way of drawing functions. So I'm going to say that this is the x-axis, this is the u-axis, and this is the y-axis. And on the x-axis, on the x-axis, I'm going to choose a, uh, a little vector. So this one. And remember, x is a, this, each of these axes is a, copies of, is a copy of the reals. So uh, this thing that I've drawn here, is it a positive real or a negative real, and why? It's a positive real, and why? Be because it, its sense is, it is, with the same, is the same as the other one. So now, suppose that the way that we, per, the way that we get u's from x is, is with a g. Suppose that g is what does this. And suppose that, further, that this point right here of the, the, the tail of the arrow by g is mapped to right there. So it goes right there. And suppose further that the head of the arrow ends up going right there so that the result looks like this. Okay. Now I purposefully drew the green one bigger the green arrow bigger than the red arrow. So what I'm what I'm telling you is that if we took if we took this point right here and and incremented it forward then it would then in the first place to get from here to here is g but then when you take the red input and increment it forward like that the green input increments forward like that. Okay? So from this picture, you should be able to tell me, what is the sign of the derivative? Positive. What would it look like if the sign of the derivative was negative? Right, the sense of this arrow would be the opposite of this one. The orient they'd be opposite. They it would have twisted. It would have twisted. Furthermore, you can even tell me if the derivative is more than one or less than one. It's more than one. Why is the derivative more than one? Right, because the green one is bigger than the red one. And at least the way I drew it, it, it looks like it's close to two. If the green one was really tall, it'd be close to eight or something like that. Okay, now, suppose that the way that we take a u and get a y is with f. Suppose that's how we do it. And suppose that we ignore the first part of the chain and we, <laughs> the first part of the composition, and we say, well, what would f, what would f do to this? And let's just watch what it would do. Let's say that uh, f happens to take this point to down here, and then when we increment the green that way, <coughs> it ends up coming to right there, and the result is <coughs> this arrow. So again, the derivative is positive because the arrow didn't twist over. It'd be pointing down if the derivative was negative. And furthermore, the derivative is more than 1 because the blue arrow is even a little longer than the green one. Yes? Uh, it doesn't need to be more than 1, right? It just needs to be more than 0. Well, if this had shrank. <coughs> for, for the green, from red to green. It, it, it is going to be more than 1. The reason is because, so let's just draw it. <coughs> What would it look like if the derivative was positive but less than 1? Then it would look like this. It would mean that you take an arrow, and we want it to be positive but less than 1, so it could be mapped to something like this. 
still pointing in the same direction, but smaller. So this, this could be something like the derivative is one third. I would decide if derivative of zero would be of the same length. There's no change. We'll, we'll see why. We'll see why. Yes? It, it, the reason is because we'll, we'll see why. Yes? So uh, the magnitudes represent that, that uh, slope, right? The, rel the relative magnitude. Relative yeah. The, the translation, well, that's just like, uh, that doesn't mean, it, it just means where would, that, where would that point go? This point goes to that point. You can imagine that you took, say, here's a really boring function, a constant function, f of x is 7. Then all the points go to 7. Like 100 goes to 7. Million goes to seven. They all go to seven. So, so this is just saying where that point goes. <clears throat> okay. So now, there's, there's two items here to consider. In the first place, this red point becomes that green point, these tails. What, what tells the tails where to go? G does, right? Because, or, or at least on this leg. So if this, to abuse the notation a little bit, if that is the point x and this is the point u, then what we're saying is that u is g of x. So g is what's telling x, by the time you get over there, you need to be there. Then the question is, is who, who, who's telling the arrow to get bigger? What tells the arrow to get bigger? So now, in a further slight abuse of the notation, I'm going to refer to this arrow as dx. So I'll say that its size is dx. And if we're going to say that this, uh, this arrow is anchored at x and it has length dx, then, and this one is anchored at u, what are we going to call this one's length? du. My question to you is, is that who tells what, what tells dx to get bigger, to change its size and possibly direction this by the time it gets over here? The derivative. Specifically, du is g prime evaluated at x multiplied by dx. So the reason why the green arrow, the reason why the, this indicates that the derivative should be bigger than 1 is it's the question, did dx get bigger than d, uh, sorry, did du get bigger than dx? It did. Du is bigger than dx by the time you get over here, so g prime of x must be more than 1. If, if the derivative were, were 0, then this red arrow would have been squashed to a point. Okay. So, so g tells x how to become a u. Who tells u how to become a y? F does. So specifically, why is F evaluated at U? Okay. Now, if this is, if we're going to name this point Y, so that anchor point Y, and we're going to name the length of it, what are we going to name the length of it? DY. Then who tells DU that by the time you get over there, you need to be length DY? The derivative of F tells it that, right? But where is the derivative of f evaluated? At u. So specifically, we have dy. Is the derivative of f evaluated at u du? OK, so now here's the upshot. The question is, is what, if I, what if I conceal all of the internal machinery? What if I conceal all of the internal steps? And I just say, what would it be like to take the red arrow to the blue one? That is to say, this red, red dot becomes this one, straight to there, ignoring the internal step. And this arrow goes to that one, ignoring the internal step. Then who tells an x to become a y? The composition, right? Because this leg is given by f composed with g. 
So, that means that here we have that y is f composed with g evaluated at what point? x. And then who tells, uh, who tells dx by the time you get by the time you get over here to be a blue arrow, how big you're going to be. It's the derivative of this one, right? So what I want you to do is take these two equations. I want you to take this equation and that equation. du is the derivative of g at x dx. And dy uh, is what? The derivative of f at u if, uh, multiplied by du. And now I want you to eliminate the u's. That is to say, I want you to ignore the internal step, ignore the machinery in the inside. What happens? So notice that this du, I can substitute it with that one. Suppose we do that. Then we would have dy is f prime evaluated at u multiplied by g prime evaluated at x multiplied by dx. That gets rid of the u, the du, but now how do we get rid of u? By replacing it with g of x. And so now, if you wanted to make a red arrow become a blue arrow, if that's what you wanted, and you wanted to ignore all the steps that happened inside, then the size of the red arrow, dx, needs to be multiplied by this factor to get the size of the blue arrow, dy. And of course, what is this? The chain rule. So this is what I'm saying, is that if you take an x and wiggle it a little bit, then it causes the intermediate u value to wiggle a little bit too, which in turn wiggles this one over here that much. And the, 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 the accumulated wiggle if you like, is obtained by product. Okay, so, so if the first step makes this arrow twice as big, and then the second step makes that arrow three times as big, then how much bigger is the arrow? Six times. Six times. Because in the first place it was twice as big, and then it was three times as big, and altogether it's six times as big. There's a real common example of this that you use in biology class. So you can see little bitty things. A microscope, right? A microscope. <coughs> microscope. You, you put the photons through the one lens, spreads them out by magnitude 40, and then it goes up the whatever bit, and then goes through the eyepiece and spreads out by another factor of 10. What's the total magnification? 400. Thank you, chain rule. <laughs> right? Every time you look through the microscope. Good. So any question about the chain rule? Now, now the, the real question is, is what bearing does this have when we change all of the scalars to vectors? Okay, so that, that's, that's what we need to address. So is everybody ready for it? <laughs> okay, good. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> So here we go. Get all the stuff written down. Theorem. Let U a subset of Rn be open. And let A be an element of U. In the first place, uh, one the derivative is linear. That is to say that if you had two functions that are differentiable at A, then the sum of the derivative of the sum function is the sum of the derivative functions. Okay? And if you had a function that's differentiable at A and you multiply it by a scalar, then you can factor that scalar out and the result will be that scalar multiplied by the derivative of that function. So the derivative is linear. 
in the first place. So second, uh, if you have let f from u to rm be constant, so suppose we have a constant function, what's its derivative? Its derivative is zero, but you have to be a little careful. Uh, specifically, the derivative of f at a, in the, uh, we can't write this, because that wouldn't make sense. Why doesn't that make sense? So it's not, it's, it's not a vector either. It's not a scalar. Uh-oh. What, what's the, yes, what's the, <laughs> what's the signature of f? It takes Rn to Rm, right? So this, this, whatever this is, whatever this is, should have the same signature. It should be something that can take a vector in Rn and take it to Rm, and every single time that you take a, any vector from Rn to Rm, the result should be the zero vector. So, so what is this? This is the zero matrix. And what are its uh, dimensions, I guess, is the right word. It's n rows n and columns, n by n. So uh, it's, it's a matrix uh, of, of, of zeros. Good. Three. Let f from u to rn, uh, sorry, rm, be linear. So it is a result of linear algebra, an important result that every linear function is representable by matrix multiplication. So suppose that f is linear and it has matrix Uh, given by m, that is to say that f evaluated at any x is given by the matrix m multiplied by that x. Suppose that's the case. Then, is f differentiable? Yes. So in the first place, then uh, 3.1, f is differentiable. And even better, you can tell us exactly what the derivative is. What's the derivative? Jacobian. It is. It will be given by the Jacobian, but you can tell me exactly what it is right now. The derivative of f at any a is given by what? M. <laughs> okay. Now, to 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 make that clear. I could ask, well, what's the derivative of, say, now this is a scalar calculus function, Sca sc scalar calculus. What's the derivative of 3x? Three. 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 What's the derivative of 4x? Four. Four, no surprise. What's the derivative of mx? Five. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> m, right? The derivative of, of any constant times x. Now here's the thing, every linear map from reals to reals is given by multiplication by a constant. They all look like this. So this, all that this is saying, is saying exactly the same thing, except when, the, except the constant multiplier, instead of being a scalar, a constant scalar, is this constant matrix. Okay, good. <clears throat> Four. Let let f1 from u to the reals, f2 from u to the reals, uh, dot, dot, dot. fm from u to the reals be differentiable. So those are all, every one of those is a differentiable function that takes a vector to a scalar. And it does so in a differentiable way. Let 
this function, f, be given by f1, f2, dot, 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 fm. So now what I'm saying is let's consider the vector valued function that takes all of those real valued functions and just stacks them all up in one big column. Okay, so, so what I'm saying is, more or less, suppose that we have a function that looks like this and every single one of its coordinate functions is differentiable. Then what's the result? Then this function is differentiable, right? If each one of these is differentiable, then the whole thing, take, the, then the thing taken as a whole is also differentiable. And f is differentiable, and furthermore, furthermore, how do we compute its uh, derivative? Right. And its derivative, <coughs> df, <coughs> would be uh, in the first column, it would be d1 f1, d1, f2, d1, fm. So that'd be the first column. You compute the derivative with respect to first variable in the first column. And the derivative with respect to second variable in the second column, all the way over to the last column, where it's d, what's the derivative, what are we differentiating with respect to in the last column? The, the nth variable, right? The, What's the phonetic one for N? November. November. I keep forgetting that. D November. So D N F1, D N F2, D N F M. <clears throat> okay. Good. So it's differentiable and it's differentiable in that way. Uh, its derivative is that. And moreover, <coughs> Conversely, if f is equal to f1, f2, and fm, and f is differentiable, Then what? So now I'm saying. Yeah. That's right. Then each fi is differentiable. <coughs> so the the point of this four of item four is to say that that you can proceed by coordinates. You can say, well, let, let's check each coordinate individually. Suppose the first one is differentiable, the second, the third, all the way down to the last, then the whole thing is differentiable. It's also saying that suppose that for some reason you have a vector valued function and, and somehow you know that in fact this function is differentiable, then you need not check whether or not the individual coordinate functions are differentiable. They must be. Yes? So if uh, one of the elements of f is not differentiable, The whole thing's off because it's and, 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 and. So here's a, here's a funny joke. Not a joke, but at any rate. Uh, I could give you a function and I could say, determine whether or not this function is differentiable at, say, the input value 3, 4. And if, I, and, and if there's like 48 component functions, you have two options. I'm either saying verify that all 48 are, of these are differentiable or... I want you to scan through the list and find the one that isn't and then tell me that it's not differentiable because that one isn't. Right? It, it has to be true for all. <clears throat> yes? <clears throat> so if each function is taking uh, going from reals to reals, then you should just send No, it's not. It's, it's u to reals and u is rn. So, it's ve so each coordinate function is taking a vector to a scalar. Yes? So what are the coefficients on the D? The subscripts? Yeah, the subscripts, sorry. 
the subscript means means partial differentiation with respect to the indicated variable. So if if we were dealing with if if n were, were three, then you could say that this is the derivative with respect to x in the first column, the derivative with respect to y in the second column, the derivative with respect to z in the third column. Yeah. So there's x one x one x two x three and then there's uh, yes. Just, I'm just, this is all construed at a single point. So we're talking about a single point. And then you could say, well, what if it's differentiable everywhere? Then, then it goes for all of these places. Did you have a question? Yeah, uh, number three, so you would think R min, right? Yes. And so we take R min to R min? Yes. Because, because, so, uh, so I have a question for you. Suppose that we have this matrix right here, and we have this vector right here. And the input, the input is, is, a, is a column vector with, uh, that has n components. Then what is the shape of the input? n by 1, n rows, 1 column. Now suppose further that I want the output, suppose further that I want the output to be m by 1, so that this would be rn to rm. So we're going to take one of, the, one of this kind and make one of that kind. And suppose furthermore that the way we're going to do it is with a matrix. Then that, that tells you what the rows and columns should be for the matrix. What should they be? M by N. M by N. This is why. <clears throat> Other questions? OK. <laughs> Will we have enough time to get to it? Do, I still have 180 seconds. That's a lot of seconds. OK. <clears throat> what, which number am I on? Five. Five. <clears throat> so now suppose, suppose that F, let's agree with the book and use the same names. So suppose that F goes from U to the reals. So now F is real valued. F is real valued. And suppose that G goes from U to RM. So F is real valued and G is scalar valued. And these are both differentiable at A. At point A. Then we could define P of X to be F evaluated at X multiplied by G evaluated at X. Now, would someone please tell me, why does this product, which is why I called it P, why does this product make sense? Well, what kind of thing is F? Yeah, so F is a scalar, G is a uh, vector. So this, so this makes sense, this product makes sense. Then now what I'm going to ask is, well, what about the derivative? How will, we, how will we compute the derivative of this? And it is going to be a product rule. It is going to be a product rule, but here's the punchline. The derivative of P evaluated at A and then applied to the increment H. Applied to the increment H. Is going to be... Uh, the derivative of f evaluated at a and then multiplied by the increment uh, h applied to it and then uh, multiplied by g at a. So that is like the derivative of the first one and then you apply it to the increment and then you multiply it by the second one and then plus the first one multiplied by the derivative of the second one and 
and then apply the increment to it. So here's the problem that a lot of students run into conceptually, is that this formula, this formula cannot be written down properly without also writing down the increment. So notably, the product rule 45 minutes ago, we wrote it down, we didn't have the H. And that's, in the end, that's because scalars have this nice property that they're also vectors. So you can kind of get rid of it. But here it's not possible to do. You can't write this formula without the H. Now let's think about why you couldn't possibly do it. Let's think about it for a moment. Consider this right here. I just need 30 seconds. What is the size of this matrix of rows and columns? It's 1 by n. This is 1 by n. Okay. What is the size of the increment h? So this is 1 by n. What is the size of this one? n by 1. What is the size of this one? Uh, m by 1. So look what would happen. Can you remove the h? You can't, because if it weren't there, you'd be saying, I need to multiply a 1 by n row vector by an m by 1 column vector. And you couldn't do it. Uh, yeah. The, the, result, the result of this computation will be a scalar. And that's why you can't get rid of the h. You just can't be rid of it. So just like the, the definition of derivative looks all weird when you insist that the input can be a vector, so does the product rule. The product rule becomes all weird. And we'll continue this discussion next time.